we will have a book signing ceremony here. It's been advertised in the local um, Daily Sun at the Villages. And little did I know we'd have such a big Barnes & Noble store right here in the Villages in Central Florida. Um, this is a place that's in between Orlando and Ocala. And the Villages right now, it's like its own little city. It has 82,000 people. It's amazing. And uh, now we're going to go into the store. Okay. Hello. Okay. All right. Wow, what a store. What a store. Really nice. And then we'll go to where I'll be speaking. And they'll be setting it up shortly, but... Basically, I'll be standing in front of that table there and uh, giving my speech about the lack of fiscal responsibility and public accountability in Washington. Labels today are not meaningful anymore. Uh, you have to look at what the people stand for, who they are, what's their background, what's their stand on certain issues. Things are much more complicated. So you find good conservative Democrats, and you can see them. They call the blue dogs in Congress today trying to stop the spending, and I say good because my issue as a conservative Republican on fiscal issues in particular is to stop government from spending money they don't have. Because what's happening is now we're borrowing from people, China for instance, we're up to $1 trillion, and China is a state that doesn't share our values. So what's going to happen in the next generation if we keep borrowing from them to spend today, and what about the next generation? Are we now putting a mortgage on their head? Is every unborn child today going to be born with a tax bill? Who's going to pay if we're not going to pay? It seems like the game in Washington, and it was there when I was there. Don't forget, Reagan had budget deficits too. This is how it all started with me. Because we had something called Graham Rudman at that time. We were going to try to get rid of the budget deficit over four years, 25% a year. It didn't work. Then they came up with PAYGO. That was 1990, the Budget Enforcement Act. Uh, we cannot spend unless we take it out of another area of spending or we raise taxes. Well, that didn't work. So we put everything on automatic pilot, and Congress just spent thinking that we need it, we're going to spend, until people yell really loud, which they're only beginning to do now. So from when I left Congress in 1989 to now, a lot of people were seduced by Bill Clinton saying, hey, we got budget surpluses. We don't have deficits anymore. But what he didn't tell you was those were phony surpluses, just like the deficits today are phony deficits because they're not using the right accounting system. If they use the accounting system that the Securities and Exchange Commission uses to protect shareholders, then you would see much larger deficits and a huge national debt. You're not seeing it. Now you might say, well, Joe, what, what is it? What's the difference between that system and what the government's doing? Well, the government is on a cash basis. You know what the cash basis is? It's what you use in your checkbook when you balance your check register. When you write a check, that's when it's an expense. Even though you may have been billed three months before, you don't say, I just was billed, I'm now going to put it in my check register because that's an expense. You wait until you spend it. Well, that's not the right accounting system if you want to run a publicly traded company, certainly not a right, right accounting system if you're running a government. So the system is called the accrual basis of accounting. It's called generally accepted accounting principles. It's the basis upon which every big auditing firm has to sign off on a financial statement if you're going to buy the stock. Now, what's the difference between that accrual basis and the cash basis? The difference is that when you get billed, or when you have a liability, or if you're a bank and you know that a portion of your loans are already bad, you're not going to collect them in the future, you have to reflect that as an expense today. You can't wait until the event happens. But that's what they did in 1987. You remember the SNL bailout, savings and loans? They didn't record as the loans were going bad, just like they didn't record now, the toxic loans going bad. They wait and they wait and they wait in Washington until there's a crisis and then they call it a bailout. 
they go to the public all at once and say, well, we can't solve this. So we need to borrow a huge amount of money. The government now has to intervene, and we have to bail out. Well, that's not the basis upon which these publicly traded corporations get their certifications and protect shareholders. So my book, Unaccountable Congress, if you haven't read it, and then you'll, I see you've got already a copy, there are three things I bought. My book, uh, an article that appeared in the Washington Post just last August, look at the name, Time for Budgetary Truth. Budget is important. You might say, well, what's the difference between the budget and the accounting? Basically the same, but things are budgeted before they're spent and before they're accounted for and before they're reported. So if you get in front of the cycle, you got to get it when it's budgeted because Congress is totally tied up in budgeting. But if we don't impose the right accounting system as they're budgeting, then you poison the process all along. It's already too late. Once they've spent it, hey, you, you can't get it back. And then the other thing I brought is this little uh, booklet that includes the best articles I've written over the years. And the one in the middle, if you, if you don't want to read the whole book right away, read this right away. Because this is the article that compares the system of accounting in the federal government to Enron. Remember Enron went bankrupt? Okay? Well, basically what Enron did was put losses off the books, put debt off the books. They kind of exploited the accounting rules to say that if I don't control a special purpose entity, then I can literally do some things and keep them off the books of my company and therefore the shareholders won't be affected by a decrease in earnings per share or something else. So what they did is they took the rule and they perverted it. They went to Merrill Lynch, they went to Lehman, they went to Goldman Sachs, and behind closed doors they said, you know, we need this special purpose entity. And we know that if we ask you to take the risk with that entity, you're probably not going to do it without our guarantee. But that guarantee means that you do control the entity. So it should have been consolidated. But they signed agreements with these entities for big fees where they didn't disclose that there were these guarantees that the accountants then would have said, wait a minute, you can't separate this from your books because you're guaranteeing it. It's got to be on your books. And literally, many of those companies spent billions, hundreds of millions anyway, uh, because they were charged with securities fraud. Merrill Lynch was one of them. But then Enron, when it was all exposed and they put everything back on Enron's books and the accountants were then able to do the right audit, we found out Enron was bankrupt. Now, I said that here because I wanted people to know the same thing's happening today with the federal government. The only difference between the federal government and Enron is the federal government can keep raising taxes if they can get away with it. And it's getting tougher to get away with raising taxes. So they're still trying to spend, and if you can't raise taxes, what's the next best thing if you want to spend? You borrow, correct? Print money. Or you print, which is what the Federal Reserve System is doing. In fact, Ron Paul has a bill that I support, audit the Fed. I gave a, a, a rally speech for him. He didn't come to New York, and I kind of took his place. And I said, this is a great idea, but we have to audit not only the Federal Reserve System, we have to audit the entire government, all the spending. Because right now there are no outside auditors on any of this. They have these Department of Defense auditors, internal auditors, you have the Government Accountability Office, you have the Office of Management and Budget, you have the uh, con Congressional Budget Office, you have all kinds of entities, but you don't have a real independent auditor. And if you don't have someone who's independent, and objective, you're never going to get the right answers because the politicians know how to trick or or to disguise things when it comes to this. And don't forget, money still rules in Washington. So that a lot of special interests, look at the banks right now. The banks should be regulated much more based on what we've seen, this collapse. And yet, the thing that we're trying to come up with to protect the consumers is called the Federal Consumer Protection Agency, or the Consumer Federal, no, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. All of a sudden, we're hearing even Obama saying, well, we're not sure whether we want to go that far. What do you mean? We need a very strong watchdog agency to protect 
the people, especially if the banks are going to go back to making money and they're doing it already. Look at it, Goldman Sachs. Stock is way up. Look at the bonuses. Last year at this time, you couldn't talk about a bonus. And now we find out that Merrill Lynch hid the bonuses before they made the deal to go into Bank of America. And they, just this week, the CEO of Bank of America had to leave. He was, you know, almost fired. He saw it, the writing on the wall. So his name was, I believe, Ken Lewis. So he left. Uh, but now, all of a sudden, bonuses are back. Uh, the banks are, at least some of these investment banks, are making big money. Citicorp is still suffering from the toxic loans. We still don't know what it's worth. Nobody can still figure out how toxic the loans are. And now I read in the papers, I have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal, that they are trying to repackage these toxic loans by slicing and dicing them a different way to see if they can get the credit agencies again back in to give them a kind of okay. Remember what happened with those AAA ratings? And now we find out the credit agencies were paid by the people that they were rating. That's not independent. That's like the auditors being paid by management. Auditors are hired by the boards of directors. I know that's how I make a living these days. I'm on the boards of companies, and as a CPA, um, I have to do some of the heavy lifting on the audit committee, but it's the audit committee of the board that has to screen and then write, sign the engagement letter with the auditors, not management. Because management's always looking for higher earnings. So they're going to try to say, well, to the auditors, you want to get paid this year? You want that increase? Well, don't start looking at all these other things. You know, keep your mind on right here. You can't tell that to auditors. Auditors have to audit what they think is the right thing. So I wrote the book. You might say, well, Joe, why aren't you in Congress today? Well, when you get to Congress the way I did, which was very tough, uh, I announced against incumbent Dick Ottinger. His family was a Georgia Pacific money worth billions of dollars. He had carved this district for himself. Look what they're doing today with redistricting every 10 years. Do you think that's independent? No. It's totally political. And what's happened over the last 20 years, worse than when I ran, is the Republicans are protecting the Republicans, the Demo Democrats are protecting the Democrats, and they have computers now to figure out how many more Republicans can I add to my district to protect me so I don't lose my seat. And the Democrats are doing the same thing. They're shaking hand behind you know, closed doors. You know, Don't argue with me. We won't argue with you. So that today, out of 435 seats in the House of Representatives, only 30 to 50, possibly 50, but really only 30 seats are competitive. In other words, you cannot change the House of Representatives that easily. Because number one, to take on a Democrat or Republican, you have to go into a primary. You know, a primary election before the general. But to do that, that means you're going against the party, because the party will always support the incumbent. Because the incumbent brings back the bread and, and brings back the money from government to the local areas. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, but it's gotten so far off the mark, and you've heard the concept earmarks. Earmarks are when congressmen and congresswomen interfere with the process of spending. They've already budgeted the money. If I want to budget, let's say, $500 billion, which we're doing this year for the Defense Department, uh, Congress can weigh in on that, and they have debates just like they're doing on health care right now. But once it's decided that that's the budget, then Congress should step aside and let the professionals say, now how are we going to allocate this $500 billion? You have the generals, you have engineers. Don't forget, a lot of this money is in equipment, buildings. And by the way, we don't have a capital budget in the, probably didn't know this, there is no capital budget, meaning that when they budget several hundred billion dollars for buildings, aircraft carriers, I'm not saying for bullets, bullets you can write off. You should be putting them on the books as assets, and those you should borrow against. Nobody's going to say you can't borrow to build a building or a billion dollar aircraft carrier, but the federal government has this huge amorphous pot called the budget process where they don't separate capital items from operating items, and what happens is they give the idea to everybody in government, oh, that's been written off because when you spend let's say this year $400 billion on equipment, buildings, aircraft carriers, that's in the deficit. 
That's wrong. That should be on the books and you could borrow. Now, you might say, well, that should help politicians because they could say, hey, we've got these assets, let us borrow. And you might say, well, why don't they do it? Because they know the other side of it. Once you shift to that system, now you're talking about the accrual basis, depreciation, amortization, it's called, over a period of time, you allocate the costs over generations. It's fair to everybody. But once you do that, you gotta look at the liability side. We have many, many, many more liabilities than we do assets. So they're afraid if they adopt that system, then someone like Joe Diaguardi is gonna say, hey, wait a minute, what about the liability for Social Security and Medicare? 45 trillion. Notice I went from B to T. 45 trillion dollars is off the books today. It's not even on the balance sheet of the United States of America. And yes, there is a balance sheet. It's called the US, the Consolidated Statements, Financial Statements of the United States of America. My firm started it, Arthur Anderson, back in the 70s, and government picked it up in the early 80s. It's never been able to be audited, believe it or not, because the Defense Department still has books that are not in good enough shape to audit. So literally almost 50% of the books of the United States of America today cannot be audited. And if you think that I'm speaking because it's a small group here in the villages, go to my website. I'm gonna give you all a copy of my card before I leave here. I've got them right here. It's truthingovernment.org and you'll see my testimony before the Federal, the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Board, which is the board created by the bill that I put in as a freshman congressman, here it is, the Chief Financial Officer Act, and I found out over a period of time that they've been poisoned too because they get their funding from the Treasury Department and from other governmental agencies, meaning that they can't be an honest broker when it comes to accounting principles, and somehow the Treasury Department has convinced this group of 24 professionals, but of the 24, many of them are uh, appointed by the Treasury Department, the Government Accountability Office, the uh, Office of Management Budget, so that the funding is now giving them a conflict of interest like the rating agencies. And what they've done is the Treasury Department doesn't want to show the people that the real national debt is not $11 trillion, which is what it is today. At the beginning of the fiscal year, and by the way, our fiscal year is September 30th, and it just went by a few days ago. Uh, when this fiscal year began, Bush was president. The national debt bonded, that's treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds, was $9.3 trillion. It's going to be over $11 trillion. We'll get the real number in about a month when they publish the numbers. And you might say, well, that's a lot of money. But that does not include, on the accrual basis, all the liabilities I was telling you about. The things that we should be recording now so we don't have to have another bailout. In effect, toxic loans. We've now bought a lot of this for the bailout. But worse than that, we have Social Security and Medicare. The actuaries say if we were to right now compute it the way we force companies like General Motors and others so that we know what their pension liability is, it's $45 trillion for everybody working today money has to be paid out. Now, are we saying put $45 trillion aside? No, we're not saying that. What I'm saying is put it on the books as a liability so the people are not fooled. You're saying it's $11 trillion. I'm saying it's $56 trillion when you add that. Okay? And that's, by the way, thank God, Washington Times, New York Times would not publish this article. So I sent it to Washington nice. and they published it, and I say that here. Now, you can be sure if that were not the case, the editors would not put it in here. They have to look at, uh, at least get a sense for what's going on. I have a special background. I'm the only practicing CPA ever elected to Congress. I gotta leave something here that shows I was here even if it's one term or two terms. Well, it was two terms. And then I decided to start writing this book in 1990. And I didn't have staff that understood this, so I had to write this book. I had a good researcher working with me. And we covered the gamut of what was wrong uh, without using too many technical words. For instance, uh, I love, well, I picked the, uh, the titles to these chapters. Plastic budgeting, you know, plastic budgeting is what we have. Uh, but if you go to chapter uh, five, this is a chapter on social security, congressional child abuse. 
send the kids to build. It's a Ponzi scheme. Because the money that we took, the money that you put in, and people are putting in today, FICA taxes, they already took it out. Here they raised it, and don't forget, Social Security was going bankrupt, and they saw it going bankrupt in the late 70s, and they came up with a commission in the early 80s, and they raised the FIC, FICA, Social Security tax rate, and the base. So now, almost 100,000, it used to be like, what, 10, 12, 20, when I was in Arthur Anderson. Then they raised the rate as well. And a lot of money started to come in. But rather than leave it there, they said, you know what? That cash, we can use it to balance the books. And what did Lyndon Johnson do? Even before they raised the rate, he came up with, and you'll see it in my, my book, Plastic Budgeting, the euphemism, I call it a euphemism, called the, um, the unified budget. He saw all this cash sitting in the Social Security Trust Fund. Medicare wasn't up and running at that point. It just started. And the Highway Trust Fund, he says, why can't I offset that cash surplus against the deficits of all the other accounts and report to the people on the budget process only the net? What that tells you is that the deficit you're getting has been already reduced by the cash we've collected in FICA taxes. That's not right. That should have been shown, you know, that money should have been put aside at least for accounting purposes. If you wanted to borrow it, that's one thing. But don't offset it for budgetary purposes and tell the people that our deficits are this when they're this. And that's the system that Clinton then inherited. He didn't change it. So under that system, he started showing surpluses because the spending after Ronald Reagan on defense, don't forget, why did Ronald Reagan have deficits? He was trying to rebuild America's defense. He spent a lot of money on the defense, and that's what bankrupted uh, the Soviet Union, remember? Because he played a game of chicken with Russia, saying, no, we're going to keep building, we're getting stronger. Finally, Russia just collapsed. It ran out of money, and they had to admit it. So the evil empire exposed that it was bankrupt. And then Gorbachev had to let the country just go back into its parts. And that's when the Soviet Union just dissipated. We have Russia today. But Putin now, you know, the guy that was trained by the KGB, he's trying to put together that Soviet Union again. So we got to be very careful. So the point is, Ronald Reagan had deficits mainly because of that. And you'll see one of my articles in here in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I'm proud to say that I had Arthur Anderson help me recompute the deficits of Ronald Reagan based on the de and, uh, uh, and compare them to the deficits of um, Jimmy Carter. Because I convinced the Wall Street Journal that if you use the right accounting system, Jimmy Carter had many more deficits than Ronald Reagan. Here it is. Gaps budget will that gaps general accounting accepting principles budget gaps will surprise. So here it is. I had Arthur Anderson recompute the accounting deficits for Carter versus Reagan. And when you put back what Reagan spent on capital items, which should not be in the deficit, it should have been put as an asset, you find out that Carter, and in those days everybody was saying, oh, Reagan is the biggest deficit spender of all time. Well, what happened was, when Clinton came in, he then reduced defense spending, all right? So he was showing under the phony accounting system that he had surpluses because he was using all that FICA money, FICA, the, 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 the Social Security tax money, to, to show that. So, you know, these are not easy concepts for the average person. Any other questions? I just want to make a statement. If the USSR yes. kept pounding debt in the basket, and then one day the bottom of the basket fell, aren't we doing the same thing? I mean, don't we learn by history? Yeah. We're not learning because people don't have the courage to change important things when they think it's going to deprive them of a seat in Congress. But when that bottom falls out of the basket, where are we going to be? Well, that's the point. We really are in that's uncharted waters. We're in uncharted waters right now. We don't know, even now, we don't know whether our economy is coming out or still going down. We have mixed signals. We know that the unemployment rate is still rising. We know that certain banks, like Citibank, are still in trouble because they haven't figured out yet what the toxic, toxic assets are worth. Goldman Sachs is fine. Why? Because Paulson came out of Goldman Sachs. Rubin came out. So they feathered their own nest while they were in government and made Goldman Sachs really impervious to a lot of them. But who do we trust? Who do we trust? I, I, I'm at the point where we have to I don't trust people. anything I hear from Washington we, you from know, the state. If you look at the Constitution of the United States of America, you see we the people. 
You don't see we the party. You don't see we the government. We the people. We've got to empower the people to change things again. We've got to go back to a system that brings government closer to the people. You see, we're, what we're doing now, and Obama comes out of a situation where he's comfortable with taking more power centrally. That's not good. Because once you do that, the people get confused. They don't know what's really going on. And that's bad for the accounting, for sure, because then you've got the people who want to represent who they are and look good with this accounting system that I'm railing against, that I testified against. And please look at my testimony on my website. You see how I attacked this group to say, you are in conflict. And how did I get to do that? We kind of tricked them. They asked for written testimony, and Shirley and I prepared it, and I answered all their questions. But when I got there, I put the written testimony aside. They didn't know how good I was you know, with this issue, and I just spoke for a half hour straight, and I accused them of being in conflict, of not doing what the law said they should have done when it was passed and signed by the first President Bush, but that was my law. Here it is. And they were all standing there with their mouths open. Uh, and you'll see that on a video, because I was able to get a copy of the video. See, when government does a public hearing, they can't keep you from getting a copy of the video. So I requested it, I got it, and I put it on my TV show, Truth in Government. So if you look at my Truth in Government site, you'll see me there with no notes, waving books around, waving my hands, and, and, and you'll see the, the, the reaction I got, which was pretty much, you know, with their heads down, because they had no answers. So we need to keep challenging the system, we need to empower more citizens, and we need to get away from this idea that when we go to the polling booths, oh, I remember that name. People are getting elected today, not because of their stands on issues, because the people, the, the, the public is remembering the name. In fact, it's so bad that congressmen and congresswomen are having their sons and daughters follow them into Congress because they got the same name, and they're getting elected. Ford did it in Tennessee. Duncan Hunter did it in the, on the West Coast. Uh, there's another one in Florida, I forget the name, that the, the son followed it about, about 10 years ago. Very prominent older Democrat uh, in, in southern, not, not southern Florida, northern Florida. But it's happening more and more, okay? And that's not right. We need the best people now in government, not marginal people. And the problem with government when it gets too big is they start repaying favors who do they put into places, even locally, like my county? My county now is number one out of 3,000 counties in America with the highest tax rate. That's just the county. And we have now a big election coming up in November for county executive, and that might now change things. Yeah, I hope it does. But we got to understand that unless we get the people more actively involved and responsive, it's not going to change. Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt.